It's one of the last remaining calls of the wild. The whooping cry of the Borneo gibbon over the still waters of the Kinabatangan River. This jungle island in the heartland of Southeast Asia is as unique as the animals roaming under its steaming canopy. For Borneo has no man-made boundaries. Only rivers steep to rain and the monsoons keep track of its inhabitants. There are no game parks to stem the elephant herds. No sanctuaries to reign the freedom of the island's bird life. Borneo has another claim. It's the only home to one of the world's rarest primates. Less heralded than the orangutan, more endangered than the gorilla, this bizarre monkey long rubbery nose and pot belly seldom survives in captivity. Until now, little has been known of the secret life of the proboscis monkey in its habitat, the coastal swamp forests and rivers of the legendary island of Borneo. of the stock-billed kingfisher scan the dawn mist rising from the river. This year, the summer haze has clouded already turbid waters. In the trees, the grumbling proboscis monkey wonders at the thickening air. An unfamiliar smell of danger and death shrouds the island. Once again, man is on the march with this his most devastating attempt yet to raise the shrinking habitat of the island's wildlife. Borneo is no stranger to fire. It's not unusual for authorities to burn off areas of forest and farming land prior to the dry season. This minimizes potential bushfires and often regenerates the landscape. Recent times, the greed of many plantation owners has prompted an environmental catastrophe from which the island would never recover. Indonesian forestry companies began incinerating vast wooded tracts in a quick bid to clear the land for oil palm and other plantations. The ensuing smoke and haze, coupled with the tinder dry conditions caused by El Nino, dumped blankets of ash on the island's creatures. Bird life disappeared. Terrified orangutans and proboscis monkeys fled their territory ahead of hundreds of spot fires. For these primates, already under threat from hunting and habitat loss, it was a cruel irony. Monsoons came early this year, crushing the heat of the fires. In the face of fire and water, the proboscis monkey has adapted better to water. 
It's oily weatherproof fur squeezing out the heavy rain. This colony has adopted a coastal forest of mangroves where the leaves are lush and green. On some days, they will travel up to two kilometers in search of food. But here, the supply will last a while. The Malay people call him the Orang Belanda, or Dutchman. An unflattering but affectionate nickname for a primate, they say, reminds them of the European race. Grotesque or gorgeous, the male proboscis monkey is a magnificent specimen. Averaging 20 kilograms and often more than a metre tall, he is one of the world's largest monkeys. An advantage in the face of predators, but for a tree-dwelling creature, a decided handicap when attempting to travel in silence. A large male settles himself into the swaying branches of a mangrove tree. He'll gorge himself on the new leaves watched by other members of his clan. Here, a young male, his nose not yet the celebrated proboscis of an adult, eats at a distance, his fur ruffled from a windy night in the forest. The paunch of the proboscis monkey isn't just a symptom of overindulgence. Like cows, the animal's expanded stomach contains bacteria, which ferments the food and breaks down cellulose from the bitter leaves. Primates sharing this characteristic are called colobines. The process means proboscis monkeys can build up energy from leaves and some seeds, a facility not shared by other primates such as macaques and baboons with a less complex digestive system. On the downside, Proboscis monkeys can't eat sweet fruits, insects, or highly digestible seeds. These would ferment too quickly in the animal's stomach, causing bloat and probable death. The different diets means there's little competition for food, and proboscis monkeys and primates sharing their habitat largely ignore each other. It's the monkey's nose which not only gives the animal its name, but establishes it as a primate unlike any other. There are two main theories as to why the male has developed such a large pendulous nose. The most common is that it's a way of regulating body heat in the steamy Borneo swamps. The monkey's large fermenting stomach generates a lot of heat too, 
and as a large nose provides a bigger surface area, the animal could cool down in the same way as an elephant loses heat through its ears. But the most likely scenario for the male's nose is its function as a tool to attract members of the opposite sex. Female monkeys are said to favor a large nose, and over the years, the genes needed to make them are the ones most readily passed on. In the same way, a peahen admires the flamboyant tail of the peacock. The rubbery nose of the male proboscis is said to stir the passions of the female monkey. But whatever the reason, the nose usually gets in the way when feeding. And the males often have to push it aside. Females aren't blessed with the fleshy appendage. Their short, upturned nose is similar to that of the young male. The first time I ever saw one, I was just completely blown away. We were in a small boat in a mangrove area and we were out looking for these things I'd never seen them before. I've been studying other leaf monkeys and so I was used to seeing leaf monkeys in the forest and I just stood up in the boat and I just kept saying proboscis monkeys, proboscis monkeys, look at proboscis monkeys because they're so bizarre. Still every time I see them you still get some of that same feeling back. It's like watching them for the first time because they are such extraordinary animals. There's little that Liz Bennett doesn't know about proboscis monkeys. A British zoologist, she spent two years studying a colony in the Malaysian state of Sarawak. And these days her work in Borneo with the New York-based Wildlife Conservation Society puts her at the forefront of efforts to save the species from habitat destruction and hunting. Today, the primate is protected by law in all parts of Borneo. And a recent ban on the sale of wildlife products by the Malaysian government is a sign the region is getting serious about conservation issues. There's been a big wild meat trade, which is mainly ungulates, it's mainly bearded pigs and deer, but if those are hunted for the meat trade, then that means that people in the interior that depend on those for their subsistence hunting are running out of meat. So they then start hunting smaller things like primates and hornbills for their own food. By stopping the wild meat trade, it should help the animals that are traded, but it should also help all of the other smaller species which are not traded and which are not particularly resilient to hunting. Because things like primates, hornbills, they're very slow breeding. Hunting isn't the only threat to the proboscis monkey. They're usually alert to the stealth of the giant monitor. But these lizards feed on meat and have been known to snap up primates feeding in the mangrove shallows.
This young proboscis is too intent on scuffling the young leaves to notice the potential danger sunning itself on the log behind. The monkey's greatest predator comes from water, not land. Estuarine crocodiles wallowing in the damp mudflats of the mangrove swamps wait for the animals to come down from their treetops at low tide. The boscous monkeys often swim across rivers in search of food, and the predators camouflage themselves among the dead leaves and mud of the bank. But no predator presents such a threat to the proboscis monkey as that of man and his continued assault on the environment. The future for this primate is as grim as that of its neighbor, the gentle orangutan. For the orang, though, there is some hope. Huge media campaigns have publicized the plight of this jungle giant following the devastating fires which scarred its Borneo habitat. Cash for rehabilitation centers continues to pour in, prompted by emotive pictures of orphaned orangutans. The proboscis monkey, with its bizarre appearance, is left in the wake. Borneo's coastal plains and rivers are the only places in the world where proboscis monkeys are found. And with most towns and villages situated near water, the growth of human development is gradually taking over the habitat of the long-nosed primate. The monkey's liking of mangroves and peaked swamp forests is shared by timber companies. And while logging is now restricted, thousands of hectares of prime coastal woodland have been slashed, burned or poisoned to enhance the next crop. A baby proboscis learns about climbing trees. He'll stay with his mother for about two years when he'll team up with other males to form a bachelor group before collecting his own harem. Females breed all year round. 
And after a pregnancy that lasts about five months, the tiny babies are quick to learn the ropes. Young proboscis love to play. Mothers often leave their offspring in play groups, overseen by one adult female. Although sometimes babysitting does take its toll. These surrogate mothers are called allo parents. Females without their own offspring, but who seek opportunities to interact with young monkeys. Usually they have poor handling skills and have been known to drag an infant by the leg or dangle it upside down. The warning honk of the big male echoes around the swamp. He controls a harem of seven females with various offspring. But younger males are constantly patrolling the outskirts of the family group in a bid to challenge his supremacy. Much of the time, the dominant monkey stands guard, posturing, shaking branches, and doing his best to deter any potential threat. Bachelor males, too, like to flaunt their talents and will often indulge in spectacular leaps to impress the female monkey. But the big male's display will be short-lived. More often than not, the coup will be bloodless, with the ousted male relegated to the edge of the forest. Every few years, an outside male will eventually win and chase out that harem male, because that happens in all other colorblind monkeys which have been studied, and, and indications are it happens in proboscis monkeys as well. Now, if that happens, the male will then kill all the existing dependent babies within the group, because then the females will come quickly onto heat and be able to have his babies. So he can have his babies grow up to maturity while he's still in charge before someone else throws him out. The study of proboscis monkeys is the most detailed yet. Her two years sharing coastal swamp forests with the primate taught her the monkeys spend most of their time traveling in search of food and resting. Their home range covers about nine square kilometers a year. Sometimes the riverine forests offer seeds for part of the year, while the young leaves of the coastal mangroves provide food at other times. Proboscis monkeys always return to water at night. The cool air gives relief from the heat, and keeping a lookout for predators is easier across an expanse of water than among the secrets of the forest.
Rusting reminder of a world war shadows the path of the flat headed cat. This wild feline shares the habitat of the proboscis monkey. And as a tree climber, it's always on the lookout for young primates. The male is ever alert over his sleeping harem. to the monsoon waves. A herd of Asian elephants grazes on the soft grasses of the riverbank. These creatures once roamed freely across Asia. The loss of habitat has decimated numbers, and in Borneo today, they can only be found in the northeast of the island. At the river mouth, the tide has turned. Soon the mangroves will be swamped by ocean. A sea of water will cover the ripe pickings, young leaves springing from the ground root system. The proboscis monkeys gorge, then retire to the forest for a long digestion. The young monitor caught up in the torrent will swim until it finds a log, then wait. In a few hours, they'll all be back. Low tide leaves behind an array of curious creatures. The pert mud skipper fodder for the marauding macaques. These grey, hairy primates share the same habitat as the proboscis, but their diet of insects, frogs' eggs, crabs and ripe seeds means competition for food is never an issue. crab cowers under his portable refuge. He'll chain shells as he grows. The striking silvered langer coexists in its shared territory with the other primates. More timid than the opportunist macaque, Reticent in the face of the large proboscis harems, the langer keeps to small groups, seldom venturing further inland than the coastal swamp forests. 
Its natural diet of fruit, young shoots and leaves doesn't compete with that of the proboscis monkey, so its home range is one of general harmony. Proboscis monkeys belong to a group of primates called simply odd-nosed monkeys, and their closest cousin is China's spectacular golden monkey. In both cases, the male is the more dramatic of the sexes. The golden monkey with its snubbed nose and flowing mane, the proboscis with quaffed hair and long rubbery nose. Social behavior is also similar with both species. The males keeping watch over their families, bachelor groups waiting for their moment to take over the harem, and babies anxious for new territory. <coughs> Females of the species share characteristics, turned up noses and mothers ever protective of their young. Female proboscis monkeys seldom travel alone, but bachelor males moving together in loose clans will often break away from their group to follow a harem. Unlike most primates, which usually stay within a specific family unit, proboscis monkeys will socialize with other groups. Females switch between harems several times during their lives. Young males, evicted from the group when they're independent, join a bachelor clan, a move which can cause some confusion when observing primates in a harem. It's very hard to tell the difference, particularly with an adolescent male. He looks very like an adult female. And the main way to tell a uh, harem from an all-male group actually is broadly the behaviour of the group. The harem is more close-knit, there's more social interactions going on, which means there's more calling and things a lot of the time. Whereas an all-male group, because it's an aggregation of fairly unrelated animals, is more widespread and there's less interactions going on. If you've been with them for about five minutes or so, you can start to pick up that this is probably an all-male group. There are believed to be fewer than 7,000 proboscis monkeys left on the island of Borneo. Isolated pockets exist across the Malaysian governed states of Sabah and Sarawak, while larger groups have been seen further south in the Indonesian territory of Kalimantan. But moves to allocate national parks and wildlife sanctuaries could well be too late. The reason you keep going doing conservation in the fields all the time is because you believe that something can be done. Otherwise, you'd give up and go home. 
I couldn't do my job if I wasn't optimistic. So yes, I'd like to think they have a future. The things that are needed for them to have a future is partly expanding these protected areas which the governments are working on. The other thing that needs to be done broadly is education across the board. More people worldwide, not just here, need to learn to see the value of something like a proboscis monkey more because ultimately you can come up with all sorts of economic reasons and in terms of tourism and in terms of forest ecology and all these other reasons why you should protect these animals. But ultimately, the only thing at the end of the day that's going to protect them is if people care about them. While the survival of many species is today largely dependent on captive breeding programs, a similar project for the proboscis monkey would be out of the question. The primates are among the few wild animals which don't adapt to captivity, and as a result they're seldom seen in zoos. The stress of capture usually leads to depression and in most cases the primates won't survive once taken from the wild. As well, most captive monkeys are fed fruit and nuts, a diet which plays havoc with the complex digestive system of the proboscis. The appeal of the proboscis monkey means wildlife authorities in Borneo are constantly fending off zoo requests. Taking a primate from the wild will be disastrous for the overall survival of the species. The monkeys live in harems, and capturing an adult male would halt breeding, as well as disrupt the social order of the group. Farming out proboscis monkeys to various zoos would sign the death warrant for already dwindling populations in the wild. Dusk settles over the reaches of the Kinabatangan River. The nasal honk of the big male echoes across the water as he gathers his clan together for the night. In a land riddled with waterways, protecting such primates is a difficult task, despite its high ranking on Borneo's protected listing. But even with a clamp down on hunting, the proboscis monkey has a battle on its hands. Such isolated populations encourage inbreeding, the effects of which will only be seen in time. In the short term, the animals are vulnerable to seasonal hurricanes, storms, and tropical disease blights endemic to such a region.
Dr. Liz Bennett is doing her bit to make sure the proboscis monkey doesn't join the growing list of species consigned to obscurity. Things are dying out now so fast, and if you look at a natural baseline rate of extinctions over the last 60 million years or something, we're now many, many hundreds of times above that. And so instead of a sort of slowly changing system with things coming in and dropping out of it, now we've got things dropping out far greater than the rate at which anything is coming in. And that's bound to have a much broader effect on, on how the whole planet system functions. Forests of Borneo are among the world's oldest. For more than a hundred million years, they've remained closed, their secrets held within a wild, tangled mass of plants and waterways. Once, we were surrounded by this wilderness. Today, wilderness is surrounded by us. animals like the proboscis monkey are to survive, we need to allow them space in what was until recently their own habitat. They're such stunning animals and if people see them even just once or twice they're going to remember that for their whole life and that's something that we shouldn't lose. <laughs>